Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Amir Mirchi. I am the head of region for the Middle East and North Africa for Rio Tinto. Please let me first introduce my fellow panelists. Tanseri Azman bin Haj Mokhtar, Managing Director of Kazana. Mr. Iqbal Ahmed Abi, Chairman and Chief Executive of CMARC Group, United Kingdom. Young Soo Kim, President of Samsung Golf Electronics. Raghu Malhorta, Division President, Middle East and North Africa International Market, MasterCard. Gerard Lawrence, President, of group, President and Group CEO, Jumira Group, United Arab Emirates. So my commitment is we will finish our session before 6 p.m. This is what my fellow panelists give me as a challenge for today. For those of you who may not know Rio Tinto, we are a leading global mining company, mining and metal company, with operation in more than 40 countries on six continents. Rio Tinto is proud to be a member of the World Islamic Economic Forum, and I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to chair today's CEO panel discussion with such a distinguished panelist. We live in a volatile times, and for business leaders, this presents new and uncertain challenges. This presents new and uncertain challenges as we seek to manage risk in our business and organization. During the next 90 minutes or less, we will explore how global companies are managing the impact of risk across their businesses and organizations in order to sustain a healthy business trajectory, and how we navigate the emerging categories of risk as information flows around the globe faster than even before. But first, I would like to take a broad, to broad look at what we mean by risk and talk a little about how we at Rio Tinto are managing it across our global operations in more than 40 countries and in our organization of more than 60,000 employees. I think it is important to start by saying that the risk is about both trade and opportunity. It's about creating value as well as preserving value. Risk can provide us with competitive advantage. In order to grow and to reap rewards, in order to generate value for our shareholders, host countries, communities, and our employees, we need to accept the right level of risk at the right time. Our investors look to us to prove that we are able to take risks, but that they are appropriate and carefully considered. The aftershock of the global financial crisis have led companies to take a fresh look at the risk management strategy. In addition to the more traditional areas of operational, financial, or strategic risk, there are emerging areas of risk that are becoming elevated in the company's thinking. Take social media. Sorry, I just want to move my slides. Yeah. Take social media, for instance. The speed with which information can be captured and shared and the expectation that the response come increasingly faster has created a new paradigm in risk management. But while that can be a threat, it can be also a source of great opportunity. We believe that taking risk is a core element of reaching business objective and achieving superior returns. For us, risk management is the consistent recognition of uncertainty in decision making to achieve our objectives. As a leading global mining company, we have a business model that is very different from many other industries. 
In that, we build operations that cost billions and last for many decades. The fact that we take such a big investment decision to cover such a long time period means it is essential for us to work hard up front to understand the full range of risks and uncertainty across every part of our business and at all stage of our operation life cycle, from exploration to operation and beyond their closure. It is also why mining companies seek a strong investment frameworks, both internally and externally, to provide certainty beyond the current generation of management and macroeconomic environment in the places where we operate today. In our organization, risk is managed at all levels. Our governance model for risk management uses three lines of defense of principle. This gives us an effective blend of centralized governance and local deployment. The first line of defense are our operational leaders who own and manage risk and sponsor the resources to make, to make sure we have the right risk management activities in place to meet local and global business needs. Our executive committee and our executive committee, our group risk team and central support functions provide risk monitoring and oversight and they develop policies, standards, and controls. This forms our second line of defense. Finally, our third line of defense comes from our external audit and broader governance process, providing confidence to our directors and investors that our systems are effective. We think that empowered and enhanced decision-making required an understanding of what range of outcome are acceptable. To this end, we use a clear risk threshold to determine the level of risk that can be tolerated within a particular project or business. They help calibrate our consequence scale and help determine various classes of risk. Following these classifications allows us to focus our resources on managing the risk that really matter. Our governance process are critical to our ability to manage risk at, as a business, as is our approach to engagement. At the root of our governance system is our global cut of business conduct, the way we work. We engage with our stakeholders to understand their interests and their concerns, and we work together to solve challenges we face. And our participation in a strong global institutions, such as International Council of Mining and Metal and the Extraction Industry Transparency Initiatives, also enable, enables us to manage business risk and maintain our license to operate. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude my remarks by reiterating that the obligation is on organizations to strengthen the risk management process so they can make safe and sound decisions in this environment of greater uncertainty. We must increasingly anticipate opportunities and threats ahead of us. We must have robust lines of communication in place so that we can quickly see how a risk can how a risk that starts out local might spread throughout the organization globally. And finally, we live in a world that continues to change, and we should take the steps necessary to ensure that our business can withstand present and the future turbulences. Thank you for your attention. So with this introductory, I would like to invite Mr. Asman to deliver his speech and to share his thought with you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I note uh, 
<coughs> our moderator's um, intention driven by us, the panelists, that we think less is more and less is less risky, and we will try to finish and catch up on time. So we got the end slot of a long day. Of course, we still have the evening. So with your permission, uh, I mean, I'm going to ask a very simple poll. There are four answers to possible answers to this question. How many of you, I, I will repeat the question, think the word risk, this nice four-letter word called risk, R-I-S-K, is the origin of this word is, since we are here in Dubai, Arabic. The second option is that this is Malay, since I'm from Malaysia. The third is that this is an English word. The English invented this, which is, as you know, uh, apologies to any Englishman, quite unlikely. I think they're very good at borrowing um, uh, in a good way and improving things, of course. Or the fourth is maybe it's Greek to all of us. So I'll repeat the question. The word risk, R-I-S-K, is it an Arabic word, a Malay word, um, an English word, or a Greek word? All those of you who think it's Arabic, raise your hands, please. Okay, okay. This is like an annual general meeting. Those of you who think it's Malay and the Malaysians, come on. Please raise your hands. Not many takers, two or three. Those of you who think it's, what was the third one? English. Whoa, more, more takers, okay. And those of you who think it's Greek. Ah, okay. Now, by virtue of Kazana Research Institute, sorry, my, my colleagues at Kazana actually t tell me the answer is actually one and four. It is both Arabic and Greek, and the Arabics and the Greeks, I think they're still arguing about it. Just like the Elgin marbles, I should I should answer. Anyway, I shouldn't go there. The English, never mind. Uh, no, the, the the true answer is that it is actually defined. Uh, scholars are not in agreement that they feel that uh, this is actually a Greek word about navigating the rough seas, rizikon, or riza, about something you cannot control, but there is reward at the end of that. I think what Amir was describing. There's opportunity within that threat. And indeed, the word risky is the same word as risk, originally, the scholars say. Now, the origin of that, they may debate, but the conclusion is the same, which is the key point of uh, this particular session about managing risk. And the word managing risk is also can be restated as managing reward, actually, because risk and reward is really the same, uh, the two sides of the same coin. Indeed, the wise Chinese, as you know, as many of you know, the Chinese character for crisis, which is also the Chinese character for risk, by the way, is actually two representations of Wei, I don't really speak Chinese, but I, I've learned this in the last half an hour, and Ji. Now, Wei means danger, and Ji means opportunity. So within every danger, every risk, there is opportunity. So this is basically the a very, very key point. You want reward, you've got to take risks. In fact, if I understand correctly, the prohibition since we're at the World Islamic Economic Forum, the prohibition against riba or usri is really the prohibition of making gains without having risk. Right? So we're here, business people, this is the WIEF. For every reward, inshallah, that we want to get or get, we must take risk. The issue, therefore, is the second point, what kind of risk, how do we manage risk, what kind of risk management systems? So indeed, I think Ame showed very clearly this is what Rio Tinto does. And I think partly to save time, I'm quite sure all of us have got risk management systems. We've got all kinds of templates. We've got, in fact, one of my auditors is here, so I better behave myself. That took five years from Price of the House. We've got auditors. We've got all kinds of people overlooking us <coughs> to make sure we don't you know, cut corners unnecessarily. But we need to take many bends in the course of doing business. This is for sure, right? So the second point is that, yes, of course, all of us in business got to take all measures around risk management. I'm not a scholar, but you know, we're reminded the hadith uh, Rasulullah asked us to make sure that we tie the camel and then tawakal, leave it to God after that, right? You know, if you, you must tie the camel first. So my learned friends, and I, I see them nodding. So... 
So that's not the point. The question then is maybe I can rephrase, how the hell or how in heaven do we get lucky? Right? Everybody got risk management systems or ought to have risk management systems. The point is why are some most lucky than, more lucky than others or more unlucky for that matter? Indeed, uh, the, the, the framework is the world as uh, the abstract for this session outlines very clearly is much more turbulent place. I mean, I got in some of my notes, the World Economic Forum, Davos, the annual global risk report keeps talking about the same thing. Uh, in fact, it's not the same. Every year it becomes worse even more risk, but yet, you know, some companies do better, some get luckier. As you know, you know, the, the French, Napoleon, when he was asked, what's the quality that you see most in your generals? The answer is, I like my lucky generals. He likes his generals to be lucky. And indeed, the saying, you make your own luck, is I think the essence of risk management, really, and, and therefore reward management. How do you get lucky? Uh, the short answer is, I do not know. And that's the honest answer. Anybody who says they know, I don't think anybody can really know. We can only get prepared, therefore, about resilience. Uh, I think there are some very simple rules. For example, before we try to do some good, do no harm first. Right? And then, hope, and then inshallah, you will, you will get lucky over time. You have a process, stick to the system. You will get lucky. If you get the right people, I think... Chances are you may not get it right all the time, but eventually you will get lucky more often than not. Uh, there's a Malay saying, buat baik berpada-pada, buat jahat jangan sekali. What that roughly translates is, um, never ever do bad things, and do good, and even in doing good, do it in moderation, actually. You know, don't, don't, don't go over. So these are, to me, very simple principles. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about on this subject, but to recap, it's basically about... You know, for every risk, there is a reward, or for every reward, there is a risk. Uh, yes, of course, we got to do our basic systems, right? Uh, then, you know, you basically do the right things, do no harm, do good. Of course, you know, lots of analysis today with uh, one scholar was explaining, uh, you know, Kazana, for example, and many firms or fund management firms. If I were to ask you, for every investment that we make, do you know how many we have to reject or rather have to filter? The answer is closer to 100 to 1. It's not that we're so fussy. We've, to us at least, you know, this is the, the risk and reward threshold that we're willing to take and therefore forego some of the high return, higher returns, but it's okay. This is what works for us and stick to that, stick to the system. So I'll stop there and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll all get lucky in that sense. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Asman, for your education. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Excellencies distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh It is a huge opportunity for me to be here and speak on the global risk management. But I'm surprised, and sometimes I'm not surprised, the risk discussion is always come at the end of the day, and it's always in any other business, which, is, which should not be. And I would like to share my personal physical risk I have recently assessed with my general practitioner. I feel like I'm getting older, so I thought I'll go to my doctor and ask uh, for a full checkup, whether I have any risk for my heart attack. Because mostly the decision maker and the CEOs at the, before the retirement age, they get uh, sort of risk for heart attack. So when I went, I had several blood tests and the doctor says, oh, you are absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with you. So I said, well, can you assess my risk? When do you think likely to me have heart attack? And he says, okay, hold on, let me put all your results in my computer software and see what the computer says. So he says, the computer says, 
You've got another 10 years. After 10 years, you might have a heart attack. So I said, how do I prevent that? Can you give me some uh, advice? He said, of course, if you can manage your health well, by having your good life, lifestyle, maybe you can prevent that even further. So I said, well, advise me. He says, regular exercise. Make sure you don't take much risk. Good food, don't eat fatty food, but eat plenty of seafood. So I say, well, thank you very much. This is what I do, and I supply seafood to the world. Thank you. <laughs> I, would, uh, I have done some research on global risk management, and I would, would like to just uh, share my concern with the audience. Well, those businesses like mine, which are operating on international scale and are especially vulnerable to the global risk. Business which, which operates also in their native countries is also affected by the event which happens in the world. So no business is isolated from global risk. In order to manage risk, it is necessary to identify and undertake the risk. So I went to focus on the nature of global risk by looking at the World Economic Forum 2014 reports on a global risk which highlights the key features and the perception of risk. This report particularly valuable certain information because it is the base on response of industry's leader and experts and it is produced annually, so reflects on date, thinking and trends. Risk classification. The World Economics Forum categorized global risk in five types. Economics, environmental, geopolitical, social, and technological. The key points are about these are risks are interrelated economics, societal, geopolitical, environmental. Risks are changing as technological risk has grown. Risk management, therefore, has to be dynamic to be able to address new changing risk. The 10 risks of most concern of the World Economics Forum respondent are shown on this slide. Fiscal crisis, unemployment, water crisis, severe income disparity, climate change, extreme weather event, poor governance, red tape, bureaucracy, food crisis, major financial failure, political and social instability. Most of these are what would be expected. But governance is particularly interesting. My own experience shows that as a country is developed, it is not uncommon for a commercial, legal, and public administration system to fail to keep pace so that the red tape bureaucracy and lack of legal redress and protection become a real risk. The World Economics Forum study identified that the risks which are most likely to have a global impact are fresh fiscal crisis, government debts, developed countries, bank solvencies, euro uncertainties increase the interest rate, climate change, failure of international cooperation, lack of progress in sustainability, extreme weather events. Water crisis, mismanagement of water resources, competition between commerce and population for scare water, drought and food security and cost.
The World Economic Forum study highlights how interrelated between the risk could result three particular nightmare scenarios across the globe. Lost generation because the social and economic strain on young people leading to the economic loss of social unrest. World Bank estimate over 25% of the world youth have no protective job. Loss of time, job prospects. No opportunity to learn, save, gain experience. Education cost increasing every year. Digital, distinguished, failure to internet and global system, cyber attack, hardware failure. Ge geographical tension create global instability, especially in Middle East, Asia, Russia, Ukraine, Africa, and Korea. These are the subject we CEOs are facing all the time when we make decisions. And I think uh, it is important that we should measure those risks in those areas I have mentioned, just, in, just to minimize our uh, losses. There are, we don't have much time. I think uh, we could talk about there are many issues of sustainability. My, one of my concerns is, as I am dealing in food services, food industry sustainability, where I think world must look into how we can sustain the growth of our food for hundreds and thousands of years to come for our future generation. It is important that we use minimum chemical in our mother nature, and it is important to make sure our water is treated for the marine lives and for the future generation. I think my time is up. I must thank you for listening and hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. So next, we invite Young Su. Uh, good afternoon. I represent Samsung Gulf Electronics, the consumer electronic company of Samsung Group, in charge of GCC region. There are many kinds of uh, risks around us. These risks impact us any time when we make a decision. And what is risk? Risk is defined by the potential of losing something of value. What is value? To us, definitely, sales, revenue, and profit. If we don't deliver those fundamentals to stakeholders and shareholders, we cannot survive. People say, wherever there is risk of loss, there is also opportunity for gain. So I'd like to spend, remind my time talking about risk opportunity spectrum. Each risk, we should look for silver lining, the opportunity. Next. I'd like to highlight four global business risks stand out for our product, climate change, and natural disaster and technology trend and global regional economic situation. Let me start with a patchwork of standard. In many countries, we see the trend that 
Each market is developing its own regulations. Take energy efficiency as an example. A coordination approach would give us business to the market with our product that is in line with the regulations without significant time delay and increasing cost. Of course, Samsung always comply with the local law and regulations. Second risk for us is climate change and natural disaster. Bad impact of climate change happened here and there. Also, it impacts us both supply and demand side. As to supply side, for example, in Asia, one of our warehouses was inundated by severe and unusual snowy weather that creates challenge to our warehouse and supply chain. And extreme climate means few people visit our retail outlet. It impacts us on sales of our product, which is necessary to be touched and to be experienced by our consumer in the retail channel. Because of those e-commerce, even n-commerce is on the rise. So the one is for missing the trend line. Maybe great risk to us today as a consumer-oriented company is to be behind the trend. Nowadays, it's very hard to catch consumer expectations because, you know, technology and trend is a change dramatically every day. It's those disruptive innovation that can put you ahead or put you in the dust. So, open innovation and collaboration with other companies is essential nowadays. Both risk is to us is global and regional economic situation. Latest projection by IMF paint a gloomy picture for global economic growth. In GCC, we see the bright side among the emerging market, but the risk is, is very significant as uh, the rest of the world is on the knife's edge. Keeping up isn't strategy for us. We have uh, two choices in front of us. The first one is survival. We have to survive. But survival itself is not enough. We have to make sustainable, sustainable growth with uh, innovating activities. So pendulum swings both ways, always. As a global business leader, we need to be both risk watchers and risk takers. Thank you very much. I invite maybe you want to stay there? Yeah, please. Because we... Thank you. No? It works. So, because we agree. إذا لأننا اتفقنا على دخل الوقت المتبقي، فاعتذر أولاً. 
السيدات والسادة أعضاء هيئة المتحدثين يسرني أن أكون بينكم وكما ترون بالرغم أن قدمي مكسورة فأنا هنا معكم وكنت أمازح مع أحدهم وأقول أني سوف ربما سوف أكسر قدمي الأخرى ولكني كنت مصرا أن أحضر إلى هنا للمشاركة إذا. فيما يتعلق بالمخاطر أمام أعمالنا بشكل عام في هذه المنطقة أو حتى على الصعيد العالمي نحن ننظر في العناوين الرئيسية للأخبار الإيبولا وأزمة الشرق الأوسط وتباطؤ الاقتصاد والمشاكل في مختلف أنحاء العالم عدم اليقين تجاه الوضع في أوروبا وكل هذه الأمور والمشاكل وفجأة تذكرت عندما بدأت العمل منذ خمس وعشرين سنة وبعد ذلك الوقت الذي مضى خمس عشرة سنة أو عشر سنوات في الشرق الأوسط وعدم اليقين تجاه الوضع المتعلق بأسعار النفط في بلدان الخليج والأمراض المختلفة وكل الأشياء المختلفة كل الاقتصادات في العالم واجهت مثل هذه الأمور منذ عشرين سنة تقريبا وكانت هناك قصص نجاح في الاقتصاديات المختلفة تلك التي نجحت هي تلك التي استطاعت أن تقف أمام هذه التحديات الفرق هو الفرق في القيام بالأمور كلنا كل واحد منا لديه نموذج للمخاطر على سبيل المثال وإدارة المخاطر و الفرق هو في كيفية إجراء الأعمال بحيث نستطيع أن ندير تلك المخاطر مثلا في منطقة الشرق الأوسط وفي أفريقيا أود أن أتحدث عن نقطتين النقطة الأولى هي أنه من المهم أن نفهم أنه ال الشعوب المختلفة في مناطق مختلفة من العالم تقوم بالعمل بطريقة متباينة مثلا في الخليج يعملون بطريقة مختلفة عن باقي بلدان الشرق الأوسط أو في أفريقيا وبيئة الاستثمار قد تتفاوت هنا وهناك علينا أن نفهم ذلك منذ البداية حتى نستطيع أن ندير المخاطر ومثلا لدينا زملاء في هيئة المتحدثين هنا الذين تحدثوا عن الفرص المتاحة وكنت أتحدث مع صديق لي منذ 18 شهرا كنت أبحث عن الاستثمارات لجذبها للدول الأعضاء في مجلس التعاون الخليجي وكما تعرفون فإن الربيع العربي شحذ أفكار الناس وكنا نفكر كيف سيكون التوازن التجاري في العالم وكنا نفكر فيما يحدث في منطقة الخليج والدول الأعضاء في مجلس التعاون هناك ما يزيد عن 300 مليون دولار على سبيل المثال دعونا نفكر كيف كانت الأمور قبل ذلك اليوم الأمر مختلف مثلا بلدان الخليج تستثمر في البنية التحتية التي ستكون هي البنية التحتية التي تستخدم في اقتصادات الغد وبالرغم من كل الجوانب الاقتصادية والسياسية ففي أعمالنا في السنوات السبع الماضية هناك ما قد يصل إلى عشرين أو ما يزيد عن عشرين في المئة من ناحية التزايد الأعمال أما في أفريقيا مثلا فأنا أرى أن معظم الحكومات ترى أنه لكي يكون هناك نمو مستدام لابد أن تكون هناك بنية أساسية للصناعات المختلفة ولابد أن يكون هناك حد أدنى للسكان من حيث الحقوق والمرافق المدنية المختلفة نحن قد ننظر إلى الاستثمارات أو حتى الفرص بطريقة مختلفة لا شك أننا جميعا نرى أن هذه المنطقة أي 
الشرق الأوسط وأفريقيا هي مهد للتطور والنمو في المستقبل علينا أن نأتي بأناس جدد يعملون في القطاعات المختلفة لكي يركزوا الضوء على أمور مثل الفقر البنية التحتية الأساسية التي نفتقدها وأيضا مثلا المهارات أو العمالة الماهرة و السبب في مثلا هناك معهد أنا أعمل لدى معهد إدارة معهد الإدارة أو إدارة العمال عفوا القطاعات التي تتطور بنسب أعلى والتي تقود القطاع الاقتصاد بشكل عام إذا ما قارناها ببلدان أخرى في العالم ستجدونها أعلى لماذا؟ لأن هؤلاء يقومون بالإدارة إدارة نفس مصفوفة الأعمال ولكن بطريقة أخرى لابد أن نعمل بموجب نماذج الأعمال الجديدة التي تستند إلى الشراكة مثلا نحن نحتاج إلى نظم إيكولوجية يكون فيها نمو مستدام لكل مشارك في هذه المنظومة فإذا ما حاولنا أن نعمل وفقا لنماذج إدارة المخاطر الجامدة لن تتمكنوا من إدارة تلك المخاطر لأنها قد تكون قد تغيرت عن المخاطر في السابق هذا ما فهمناه وذلك في جنوب أفريقيا من خلال الشركة المختلفة في نيجيريا مثلا في مصر كان ذلك منذ سنتين ودخلنا في شراكة مع الحكومة والقطاعات القطاع الخاص مؤسسات القطاع الخاص وقمنا بالنظام الإيكولوجي الخاص باستخدامات الهواتف وكان ذلك في فترة الأزمة التي عاشتها مصر إذا صح التعبير وكنا حاولنا أن نخلق تلك الشراكات الجديدة هذا هو ما أردت أن أقوله في الوقت المتاح لي وطبعا أنا سأناقش في إطار المناقشة العامة شكرا جزيلا Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. And I guess the greatest risk that Dr. Amir and our panel was facing today that would, we wouldn't have anybody left in the audience. So thank you so much for staying to hear us through, and I hope that you find it interesting. And I think that in understanding risk, we also obviously, I suppose, need to understand our business. And I would like to just take a few minutes to talk about the business that I am part of, the business that I am very passionate about, and that is travel, tourism, and hospitality. I thought earlier on talking about good luck was extremely interesting. Those of you who might be as old as I am would remember the great Gary Player, the golf player from South Africa, who was doing very, very well, had a great good run of winning championships. And he was being interviewed, and the interviewer said to him, said, well, Mr. Player, you're really doing so well. You're very lucky recently. How, what do you put this down to? And he said, you know, he said, I get up at six in the morning, I practice till midday, I have my lunch, I come back, and I practice again until six in the evening. So I suppose you could say, the more I practice, the luckier I get. That was Mr. Player. So a little bit about travel, tourism, and hospitality. In 2013, over one billion people took international trips worldwide. The global GDP share is now 9% of the, of the world economy is attributable to people employed, to people working, and to the economy of travel, tourism, and hospitality. We provide 266 million jobs in the industry. And that actually equates to 8.7% of the global labor force. These are figures supplied by the World Travel and Tourism Council quite recently. We have estimated that by 2020, 
we will actually be providing another 35 million jobs, taking us up to over 300 million jobs by the year 2020. In this city alone, travel, tourism and hospitality now accounts for 30% of Dubai's GDP. So a very, very important part of what happens in Dubai and indeed a very important part of what happens globally. So are there risks? Well, I think everybody knows in travel and tourism, every single minute of every single day, we are at risk within our industry. Many of you will remember the horrible situation of 9-11. I remember it well here, working in Dubai, when all of our reservations, all of our business stopped overnight. And we had to cope with that and put into place our various delta plans that we have to manage our business subsequently. But one of the biggest things we've always done, especially again in Dubai, is not just to say, well, what do we do to cut every cost we have and to minimise our expenditure, is that what can we do to recover? Because the greatest risk, as His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum has said, the greatest risk of all is not taking any risk. And even back in 2001, we actually got together in a very good example of public-private partnership with the Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing here in Dubai and all of the industry, the airline, the car hire industry, hotels, tour operators, to see what we could do to try to recover our business. And actually we came up with a lot of initiatives that were put into the international marketplace. And I won't take any time in explaining exactly what they were, except that the industry came together to work together to minimise the damage to the industry and by the end of that year, we had already recovered 75% of our business. Nowadays, we face what's going to happen with our Russian business. Russia is very important to a place like Dubai and indeed to the Maldives and other various areas around the world that rely on tourists from Russia. But we are working very hard to ensure that our Russian business will not actually go down. We're looking now at pandemics. Again, we have the Ebola crisis, and I'm pleased to see that finally the world is taking the situation seriously and really beginning to understand that the Ebola crisis has to be addressed at its source. And Western countries, developed countries, richer countries have to do everything possible to help these countries of West Africa to, contra to contain the, the Ebola crisis. A very interesting area of our business and a huge risk to the world economy is the level of unemployment around the world. We have heard of the huge numbers that exist, particularly with young people under 25 years of age. Over 50% unemployed in places like Spain and Greece at under 25 years of age. Yet, Within our business, we believe that we're well on the way in the next five, six years to creating another 30 million jobs worldwide. But our biggest problem is, is that a lot of the people who are looking for jobs are not qualified to work in our industry, despite the fact that we have entry-level jobs for so many people. So we have to look at what the educational situation is. What can we provide with more vocational education and taking much more, of, for example, the German model of uh, apprenticeships, which they apply very successfully to ensure they have qualified people to be able to take jobs on an international basis. We're also looking within our industry at what we call policies for growth. And we believe that policies for growth revolve very much around an area that we look at called freedom to travel. Freedom to travel to make visas easier for travellers worldwide, not for long-term immigration, but for short-term travel. And many, many countries are now addressing this, including ASEAN, who will set up their own economic community in, I think, April of 2015, to look at having a Schengen-type visa-free visa travel regime so that people can come easily and can buy easily the tourism products of the world. We're also looking at the risk of overtaxation and the propensity of governments to tax travellers because it is easy to do so. And we have estimated in the World Travel and Tourism Council that UK air passenger duty is damaging, is costing the UK about four billion pounds per annum and actually costing about 90,000 jobs. So I will finish my short presentation 
finished by saying, ladies and gentlemen, our industry is an industry that faces risk more than many other industries, but also is probably more dynamic and has better opportunities, particularly for young people worldwide. So as His Highness said, the greatest risk of all is not taking any risk. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'm proposing to, uh, to make sure we will finish before six, I'm, I have one question, one burning question for uh, all of you. I will ask that question, then I will go to the audience, take questions from audience. Uh, otherwise, I will continue asking you questions. So uh, I will start maybe from uh, you, Asman. Uh, taking the smart risk should be part of DNA of any successful business. As you know, today world is very interconnected. I would like to hear and you share with the audience, do you think the global business, they do enough to plan the risk and to manage the risk? Please, and then we can. <coughs> yeah, the uh, question is do we plan and manage enough? I think, uh, well, there's certainly a lot, I mean, serious global companies by virtue of being global companies, I think the basic hygiene of planning and risk management templates and system is there. I'm quite sure it's there, thereabouts. You know, there's all kinds of regulations, oversight, control uh, systems, and so on. Um, you know, but yet, uh, I think we, the, the key point was that the frequency and amplitude of a crisis, volatility are all increasing, eh? complexity. We, we know all that, whether it's in the financial world, in the natural world, so to speak, uh, in the social, geopolitical. So the uh, question is whether it goes up enough. I think it's maybe your, your key point, if I, if I read that correctly. Uh, the answer is probably not. I think uh, it would go, uh, what do you call it? I would not be complete, I think, to acknowledge. I think it's been overall a good year for Malaysia with GDP always doing well. Good year for Kazana, alhamdulillah. But of course, the twin tragedies of our Malaysia Airlines. Eh? I think, uh, you know, a very tragic, sad, some say, you know, black swan events. Somebody calculated the, the, the probability of both events happening is a billion to one, and, and you know, the, the causes of this is still unsolved in, in many respects. Can you actually plan for that? I do not know. But so, if I may use the opportunity, I, in my short introduction, like other colleagues, basically tried to make the point, for every risk, there is a reward. For every reward, there is a risk. Sure, we've got to get the basic planning and management and templates and framework right. And then I left at, how do you get lucky at the end of the day? I wanted to, you know, I, I, I just jotted down, and I'm just going to rattle this off and then leave it to... There's lots of examples, but no time. But I think the basic hygiene is one. I've got nine things here. Long-term orientation, I think, reduces risk. Simplicity in a time of great complexity reduces risk. Some colleagues mentioned about collaboration and partnerships. Or some call it trust. If you can increase trust, you reduce risk. Transparency is another way of pasteurizing, if you like the term, uh, you know, sanitizing risk by using the power of crowds and accountability to make sure that you try and do the right thing. I mean, there's a saying, I, I often don't trust myself. Actually, how do I make sure that, you know, I don't cross the line? One way is, you know, holding yourself to the mask and announcing this is what we intend to do and therefore you know, that's a, that's a risk uh, mitigation strategy. That's five. Eh? Number six, institutionalization. Big word. What that basically means is that, you know, you try to get through that it's not about individuals or about cycles. You know, what does the institution do when faced with risk or indeed reward? Number seven, I think the point about risk and reward is the two sides of the same coin implies that we, one has to be clear about your mandate, about what kind of level of risk are you willing to take in order to get what kind of reward. 
I find that often we look at many, we invest in many companies, sometimes the companies are not clear, sometimes we are not clear what's our thinking on that. I think it has to start from there, the clear mandate, or in our world, in financial world, the asset liability management framework, for example. Number eight, risk management is a collective responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the chief risk officer alone or the CEO. It is a collective responsibility. And number nine, uh, diversification. Although I think the point was well made that you, know, you have to take risk sometimes at the expense of diversification. That means you need to concentrate your bets sometimes. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Asman. So, Iqbal, uh, do you think the global organization are doing enough? Sorry? Do you think the global organization are doing enough? Um, yes. Yes and no. I mean, I have just recently experienced uh, having a new bank launch in, in Bangladesh called Non-Residence Bangladeshi Bank. And though we have a though we have a very advanced sort of technologies, and I often have a risk review meetings almost every after board meeting. Um, and I think e-commerce has a huge risk in financial institution. And uh, we, have, uh, we, ha we have maintained uh, there are certain backup to maintain the data uh, safetyness. And I think the integrity of uh, internet banking is, has, to be, has to be challenged all the time and review, uh, especially also software, password policies has to be reviewed. So I think this is something I think every financial institute or any institute, corporate uh, uh, culture must maintain to minimize the risk. And, uh, this is what I think is a, it's a big challenge and, and nowadays in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So, Yong Sung, yeah. in your view, global organizations are doing enough to plan and manage the risk? Uh, no company can cover 100% all riskers. So, but, you know, global organization always pursue to perfection. So, I think uh, global company in the whole understand the risk and then they have uh, some mechanism to sensing and what is the response to the locally. Uh, for Samsung, actually, we have a global presence in the world. And the whole branch and the subsidiary sensed the risk immediately. And then, actually, the, within 30 minutes, we share the all riskers with HQ. So HQ, uh, the, the, what is the global expertise working so HQ give us some guidelines to respond. So that kind of mechanism is working very well. And then we call it, we have a early warning system. So we set the all what is the, 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 the risk in classified and we put the, the what is the, the risk type and response, uh, what is our solution to the system. So every morning, so uh, system itself send the early warning to the designated people to manage and handle that system. Thank you. Thank you. Raghu, your view. So it's, a, it's a really tough question that you ask. Uh, so it's very hard for, uh, for the glob well, global companies or even uh, the global community to address all risks, right? Mm -hmm. So risks like Ebola that Gerald uh, uh, mentioned, uh, you could have the intention to address this as a company or even as a single government, but that might not be enough. It's back to the point that I talked about. It requires a very different partnership model to address some of those risks. I'm not sure today that various industries or various governments are currently geared up to address risks of that nature, and even if they are, on how long it actually takes them to actually address them on a proactive basis. A lot of this is very reactive, and, and a lot of times some of these things could be prevented. But because it doesn't 
happen in a timely manner, the cost of addressing those risks also become uh, fairly large, right? At an individual corporate level, I think you can address some of these risks uh, if, as long as you understand this context contextual gap that I talked about in various economies. And you have operate on that. So the answer in, is yes, in, but in a lot of cases, no, and not enough is being done. I, I mean, let's, let me give you an example. At the end of World War II, there were a lot of new entities that got formed, UN, um, as just one example, right? Over the years, right, many new risks fa uh, have come to the fore for this world. However, I don't think we've actually addressed those new risks in the same sort of rigor as how we address risks that came out. And, and I'm talking about World War II, it was 1945, 1940, uh, 1945. So we're talking about a long time back since the world community got together and started to address risks in a different way. Thank you. Well, I think it's more or less answered in a way by Raghu, but I think that within, again, with. المسألة الأهم هي تناول المخاطر وكيف رد الفعل عندما يحدث شيء سيء وقد يكون من المخجل أن نتحدث هنا عن منظمة الأمم المتحدة كيف كانت كيف كان الاحترام احترام المجتمع الدولي لمنظمة الأمم المتحدة ولا نراه اليوم من قبل شعوب العالم لأنهم على ما يبدو لا يقدرون الدور الذي حدث مثلا لمنع الحروب المستقبلية هذه النقطة التي طرحتها منذ بعض دقائق عندما يحدث شيء لم نخطط له بالطريقة المناسبة فهكذا يكون له تأثير على القطاعات والصناعات المختلفة الأزمة المالية على سبيل المثال بيّنت ذلك كم من القواعد المنظمة يكون كافيا وما هو الخط الرفيع بين الشيء المناسب والمغالاة في وضع القواعد إذا أعطي الكلمة الآن لأحد المشاركين في القاعة قدموا نفسكم أولا والسؤال شكرا جزيلا أنا مدير إدارة الاستشارة الخاصة بالإدارة في بنغلاديش. السيد راجو أشار في كلمته وفي إحدى الجمل قال بالنسبة لبلد ما فأنت ذكرت أمرين البنية التحتية والحد الأدنى من الأمن الاجتماعي وبالنسبة لي أود أن أضيف شيئا وأريد أن أعرف رأيك بشأنه الحكم الرشيد هنا كعنصر لتطوير المؤسسات أو الهيئات الحكومية والمؤسسات هل لك أن تعقب على ذلك لو سمحت؟ شكرا نعم أنا ذكرت ذلك ولكني أيضا أشرت إلى الصغرى في التسويق بطريقة أو بأخرى التفكير التقليدي هو أن الهيئات العامة تقوم بال ببناء البنية التحتية وبذلك تحقق النمو الاقتصادي لكن هذا يعتمد على توفر الإرادة السياسية لدى الحكومة لكن هذا الأمر ليس كافيا حتى نحقق التنمية المستدامة فإن الشراكة بين الحكومة والقطاع الخاص وكل أصحاب الشأن هو الذي سيؤدي إلى هذا النمو المستدام سواء كان ذلك على الأمد القصير أو الطويل 
وهذا هو السياق الذي نتحدث عنه هناك دور متزايد للحكومة من ناحية لكن هذا ليس كافيا لابد من إشراك القطاعات الصناعية والاقتصادية المختلفة وكل أصحاب الشأن في هذا السياق شكرا السؤال التالي وفد المملكة المتحدة أنا أعمل في مجال إدارة المخاطر في المملكة المتحدة في السنوات الماضية إذا كان الأمر يتعلق بإدارة المخاطر الخاصة بشركة طيران أو مؤسسة ما نحن قد نتحدث أيضا عن مسألة المخاطر الخاصة بسمعة الهيئة أو المؤسسة المعنية إذا ما أردتم أن تعقبوا على هذا الأمر كيف يمكننا أن نحتفظ بهذا التركيز على مسألة موضوع المخاطر المخاطر المتعلقة بالسمعة المؤسسية HSBC مثلا نحن لم نصل بعد إلى ذلك ولا بد لنا أن نتفهم أكثر الجوانب الخاصة بالمخاطر المتعلقة بالسمعة باكستان مثلا كانت من أولى البلدان التي أدخلت ذلك في إطار الحكم الرشيد والقانون الذي قمنا بسنه بشأن هذا الأمر ما رأيكم؟ أعتقد أن المخاطرة الخاصة بالسمعة المؤسسية هي بالفعل تتعلق بمسائل مثل الشفافية والإدماج الاجتماعي وحقوق الوصول إلى الإنترنت ومواقع شبكة التواصل الاجتماعي وغيره إنه إن هذا يعتبر سوقا جديدة مثلا ففي جلوبال سبير هناك كثير من ربما المعلومات المغلوطة أو سنودن حالة سنودن طبعا تعرفون ما حدث وكيف تم الكشف عن المعلومات ولذلك فلابد أن نفعل الأمور أن نعمل في مجال إدارة المخاطر الخاصة بالسمعة وهو أمر يستند إلى قيم وأخلاقيات المجتمع وأصحاب الشأن والشركات والجهات العاملة وما هو دور الأعمال في مجتمع بعينه ولكي أبسط هذه الفكرة لابد لكل شركة أن تعرف ما هو سليم وما هو خاطئ إنها أمور نعرفها كلنا ونعرف أنه بصورة فردية أو بصورة مؤسسية لدينا مجموعة من القيم إنرون على سبيل المثال تعرفون ما حدث وما قامت به شركة إنرون فهكذا كان هناك مخاطرة كبيرة على سمعة الشركة طبعا علينا أن نتعلم من تلك الأمور وأشكركم على أنك ذكرتنا بهذا الأمر أريد أن أضيف شيئا يتعلق بالشفافية فعندما يكون هناك جشع كبير لدى جهة ما فهي تتناسى المبادئ والقواعد التنظيمية المختلفة أعتقد أنه لا بد أن نحترم كل أصحاب الشأن وأن نحتفظ بال أو نقوم دائما بالإجراءات والعناية الواجبة وهكذا يمكننا أن نحافظ المسألة لا تتعلق فقط بال HSBC أو أي مصارف معروفة بأنها كانت مصارف أرادت أن تحصل على أرباح كثيرة جون أعتقد أن 
الاستمرار في العمل السليم الذي قمتم بتحديده في شركتكم مدونة السلوك على سبيل المثال كما أشارت إلى ذلك غريس فإن مجلس الإدارة عليه أن يتأكد أن الإدارة التنفيذية للشركة تعرف مدونة السكون هذه وتفهم المدونة وهي صارمة في تنفيذها شكرا إذا ما أمكنكم أن تضيفوا شيئا هناك أمر يجب أن يكون في مقدمة أفكارنا فيما يتعلق مثلا بما تريده المجموعة أو الشركة أن تحققه إذا رأينا العالم أجمع لوجدنا أن هناك نموذجا لابد ألا يتم مجرد تكراره لكن لابد أن يكون هناك تغيير كل عدة شهور من الأسباب التي جعلت مثلا التوازن يكون توازنا حساسا بين الفترات الزمنية المختلفة سؤال مايكروفون للمتحدث اسمي ماجد أنا مهندس لدي ثلاث أسئلة أس... ثلاثة أسئلة أولا بالنسبة للشركات مصطلح الشركات أدخل مؤخرا وذلك من قبل البنك الدولي المسألة ليست تعاونا هناك مصطلح فني يستخدم دائما من قبل البنك الدولي الشركات العامة هذه بدلا من نماذج البناء ونقل الملكية والإدارة في كل بلد لابد أن يكون هناك شراكة أو مجلس للشراكة بين القطاعين الخاص والعام وهي تضع كل السياسات والآليات المختلفة لهذه الشراكة هذا أمر الأمر الآخر هو مصطلح corporate social responsibility أي المسؤولية الاجتماعية الواقعة على عتق الشركات هذا المصطلح نستخدمه منذ ست سنوات بعد أزمة 2008 ولذلك فإني أعتقد أن الشركات في الأسواق المالية لابد أن تخصم جزءا من أرباحها من واحد إلى خمسة في المئة لتكريسها لتلك المسؤولية الاجتماعية الواقعة على عاتق الشركات على الأقل هذا سيكون نوعا من الدعم للحكومة وهذه النسبة توضع في صندوق وهذا الصندوق الاستئماني بمعنى سوف يقوم بإدارة تلك الأموال هذه هي النقطة الثانية وأريد للسادة كبار المسؤولين أن يعقبوا على ذلك Gerard, do you want to take this? Well, I take the easy one first is the corporate social responsibility because uh, I think it's more applicable, especially to a company like ours, which is still a private company, and uh, I hope it remains so <laughs> for a long time. But um, I, I, I so, so firmly believe that the, any CEO of any company must be totally committed to doing good within their community. And I also believe that within the hotel industry and here in Jumeirah, we have an amazing opportunity to connect into our communities. And I do agree 
uh, with the gentleman as well to say that there, ha there has to be some kind of formal policy within a company as to what it's going to do with this corporate social responsibility, what it's going to contribute to, to the community and how it is going to do so. Within our company, we were the first hospitality company in the region to actually publish our corporate social responsibility and report, and we do so uh, every year, and we will continue to do so. I also believe that it is something that needs to be measured on an ongoing basis, and particularly when you talk about quarterly reporting, which public companies have to do, why shouldn't corporate social responsibility be part of that? Uh, Again, in our company, because of the amount of employees we have, because of employees from developing countries, we have great opportunities to be able to help them, help their families back in their home countries through our foundation. And just to give you a small little uh, example of what we do here, there's uh, a school for severely handicapped, both mentally and physically handicapped children, which is just behind the, uh, the, the maintenance yard of the Jumeiru Beach Hotel. It's about half a kilometre from here called census. And one day the, uh, some of the employees said to me, there is a school and we've helped the school to, put, to build a library by equipping the library with videos and books and everything. Would you mind coming to open it? So we came, I came along to open this and for the first time I actually saw it. It's a residential school. There are 43 uh, children living there and there's about another 50 children who come on a daily basis. And I spoke to the great lady in charge, Dr. Lena, and I said, well, what can we do with you for you as, uh, as Jumeirah. We're very close to you. And uh, I, it was midsummer, and I said, well, what about your air conditioning? She said, yes, we need a lot of help. So we actually ended up adopting census. And this was introduced to us by the local Rotary Club. But we, we, we adopted census, and we now do the maintenance of their air conditioning, of their, of their buses, and our, our employees involved with them all the time and relate to them. It's just a small example, but I do think the whole point of corporate social responsibility is not just a nice term to use, it's something that should be very real for every board and for every company and what they do within an organisation. So, thank you. Rene, thank you. very quick, given the time, please. Uh, I'm happy to skip, don't worry. It's okay. I, I'll, we'll, I'll get him offline and talk to him. Yep, okay. So, given the time and my commitment to all of you and panellists, I want just to do a very short wrap-up of discussion. So, as man mentioned, risk management is about not cutting corners. And then Iqbal mentioned strong financial institutions, their role, how important they are. And then, from Samsung, we mention about, we talk about risk taker and survivor. Another maybe point you raised, Raghu, is was every part of the world is different. So it's required different solution. We cannot approach with a similar standard and policy for every part of the world. And then the last one, not least, is what you mentioned. During crisis, we need to be proactive and to work collectively to see how we can recover. Cutting costs, firing employees, downsizing business, should not be a solution, because this would not help the world to recover. So I would like to stop here and thank all panelists, audience, and let's give a hand to our panelists.